past seven weeks. Now, that's always a concern because I always want the numbers going in the other direction. We do know we sometimes have these spikes and they then flatten themselves out again, but we will probably be posting some things about the usual, um, you know, having people make sure they have Narcan, checking on people, and for people who are using, being very careful. What is concerning is, among other things, is the breadth of the county where we're seeing these. So let me just give you an idea. For instance, this week, we had one on Monday that happened in Lowell. We had two yesterday, one in Newton, one in Somerville. Over the course of the last seven weeks, we've had two in Arlington, two in Cambridge, Framingham, and Melrose, one each in Carlisle, Chelmsford, Drakeit, Holliston, Natick, North Reading, Tewksbury, Wakefield, Woburn, and Watertown, three in Somerville, plus the one yesterday, three in Waltham, one in Woburn and Watertown, and then we continue to see that increase in Lowell. We had six in Lowell and four in Everett. So, you know, there's a real reach of places that we're seeing that, which is concerning. To the extent that we know the substance, we had one cocaine, one crack cocaine, three fentanyl, six heroin, one a heroin fentanyl mixture, and two with pills. And Keeping in mind, we have already had four deaths by uh, overdoses, which were really suicides, all four of them by pills. So, you know, you can't draw, take a trend from seven weeks, but we want to be careful. We want to be getting that word out and we want to see that push itself back down again. So before we turn to our presentations today, I want to ask Dr. Armstrong and Dr. Barabelt from Newton Wellesley to give us a little description about a valuable virtual event, event that's going to be held on the night of March 3rd, which is next Wednesday. Um, and we'll address what part of what I think we're seeing here, which is addressing substance issues during the pandemic. So Dr. I'm not sure they've- We're not here yet? Yet, hang on a second. I have so many people I can't see. Yeah, I um, I thought we were gonna, that might be closer to 10, 15. So okay. they're not here yet. I, I saw Dr. Armstrong, but maybe I was wrong. Okay, but weed is here. The glue that holds us all together is here. So we can continue. <laughs> all right, let's move on with our program. Today we'll be hearing about two different programs. One in Lowell that especially the folks that usually attend the Lowell program um, are familiar with and we're grateful for an update and to understand how they've been handling COVID. And the second, um, very exciting, a brand new program in Melrose that we've all been looking forward to the opening of this program. So, Emond and Marisha Verma, um, Laney manages the comprehensive efforts of the Substance Abuse and Prevention Division, which includes the City of Lowell's really very comprehensive multidisciplinary post-overdose reach out. So you've overdosed, you um, or your family, they're reaching out, they're doing all of that piece. There's syringe collection, there's substance misuse initiative grants. Um, Lady is a licensed mental health counselor in Massachusetts. She has a background in corrections and psychiatric emergency services. And Lady's going to be entered the prevention field in 2017. Um, and Luisa Verma is the supervisor of Lowell Communities Outreach Program, the co-op. She has a master's degree in psychology from Goddard College, has worked with both individuals and families with substance use disorders for over three years. Um, and she's also worked with those across various ages of the lifespan and cultural backgrounds. And before I forget, I wanna just mention um, two pieces of legislation that we filed last week that we will obviously be looking for support on. One is a refile of our bill from last year that would create a trust fund that would be made up of a minuscule, um, about a penny a piece, um, additional cost, to those who either manufacture, sell, or dispense opioids within the Commonwealth. 
for, for every time CBS is selling a bottle of opioids, they'd be donating about a penny into this trust fund. And the proceeds of the trust fund would be used to reduce the co-pays on Narcan. So as you know, Narcan is readily available at the drugstore. The problem is depending on what your insurance situation is, it can cost you $10, it can cost you $70. What we have unfortunately seen that led to the filing of this bill was I use my Narcan, you know, once you've sprayed it, it's gone. I used it, it's the middle of the month maybe, I don't have the cash, I've got other expenses, whatever, I can't do my copay, I go without. And either I or the person I love who's struggling needs the Narcan and I don't have it. So this is modeled on something they have in the state of New York where they're able to reduce the copay to under $10 for everybody based on, you know, the people who are dispensing these are part of the problem. So it's appropriate for them to contribute to helping with that. Um, and the second is we have filed a bill to change chapter 123. Um, many of you are familiar with chapter 123 and the situation where um, people get sectioned, they go off to the hospital, within 72 hours, they are released. Maybe they've gotten back on their medication, they're doing fine. And very quickly, they're off their medication again, and there's an abrupt drop. Almost all of the, a very significant number of the tragedies, the homicides and other situations we have seen this year have had that kind of a backdrop. So, you know, in one case, a family took somebody who was struggling with all kinds of issues to the hospital on Sunday. They were released on Tuesday. On Thursday, they killed two members of the family. So we need to be, and the answer is not just keep them longer. That's, you know, we've moved away from that. Our bill does two things. It creates a different category within the section for people who present a real danger to others. And if they are classified as somebody who is presenting a real danger to somebody else, and they are released in the 72 hour period, the requirement is that for the next seven days, they be monitored virtually by a social worker. So for that next seven days, somebody is watching them. They can tell if they've gone off their meds because typically, obviously what happens is they go off their meds three days into that, they're not doing well. A phone call doesn't really do it. We want people doing it virtually. It allows the person, assuming the best, that they're doing great and they can go back home and get back to their life you know, they're not kept in the hospital. They're able to check in by phone or Zoom or whatever um, and just have an eye on them. And if the social worker sees that they are deteriorating, this new legislation would also provide for an expedited way to get them back in the hospital. So if on, you know, they get out on Thursday, by Sunday, they're doing really badly. We don't have to, and maybe it's a long weekend. We don't have to wait till Tuesday to get back in. They still will have to to be in touch with the judge, but it provides for an expedited process that would allow them to get back into the hospital more quickly. So I think those are two really important things. They are based on what we have continued to see. So at some point, we would love your support of those bills. Um, if I can, for just one second, Nora is texting me and says that Dr. Baraveld Dr. Is, Bar here. is here. So I'd love All to. All right. So Lady and Marisha, if you just wait, wait, a minute. We'll just let her do hers. We'll come back. Thank you so much. Doctor. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Nora, do you mind sh sharing the flyer? I am putting the link right here. So uh, Nora and DA Ryan's team will send out an email with this information so that you can spread it to your communities. But we're very pleased to share with everyone the uh, details about an event we're holding next Wednesday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. Um, it should be quite cool. And I'm just gonna pull up the, um, the actual flyer itself so that I don't say it incorrectly. But, um, but what we're looking at is um, hosting a event around substance use during the pandemic. And, um, and it's an opportunity for community members to ask questions. This is not to highlight necessarily um, patients with, with overt substance use disorder, but it's really to shed some light on the fact that we are seeing a huge increase in alcohol use, um, as well as other substances, including marijuana. There was an art, a couple articles in the Boston Globe by Kara Baskin talking about 
um, how parents are coping during the pandemic and how things have really kind of become normalized around Zoom, Zoom interactions for happy hour and how we're seeing a rises in alcohol um, sales in the state of Massachusetts. And so it's, I, I think, going to be an excellent opportunity. We're going to meet with Kara Baskin, who's the Boston Globe reporter, who wrote uh, also a recent article on dry January. And, um, and we're going to have an informal discussion with um, two women that Kara Baskin um, has spoken to during writing some of these articles, and really about what's it been like during the pandemic as a parent, as um, as someone who's full-time working, what's it been like in regards to um, seeing personally and other family members and friends and, that have had increasing substance use. And, um, and some really kind of, I think, hopefully uh, a, a little bit more informal conversation with, um, with them around what, what they're seeing in their communities. And then most importantly, there's an opportunity for um, anonymous uh, audience attendees to ask questions to experts. So we have two primary care physicians who are joining us from Newton Wellesley Hospital. We have um, Alyssa Adriani, who's our chaplain, who is a huge proponent on wellness and alternative strategies for wellness, as well as exercise. Um, and she, she leads a, a big running group at, at the hospital. Um, Dr. Armstrong, who also is part of the Boston Bulldogs. Um, we have our psychiatrist, who is the medical director for the substance use services, Jimena Sanchez, who's on the panel, and a few other folks. So I think it'll be really an excellent opportunity for us to have uh, a conversation about what, what, do we, what do we do and how do we ask for help and, and how do we recognize when this is a problem and and what do we do to, to really Im improve wellness in our community? So um, if there's any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer, but we do encourage everyone to pre-register. And then um, again, all attendees are anonymous. So uh, anyone can be there and it's totally free. Um, it, sh it will likely be recorded, we think, um, but we also wanna sort of protect the privacy of those who um, are speaking with us freely. So, um, so please let me know if, uh, if you have any questions. Otherwise, back to you, DA Ryan. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. It sounds like a great event and clearly something I think is the weather gets nicer and we realize this is going to go on for a while. Everybody can benefit from. So thank you both. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to Lainey and to Marisha. Thank you so much for waiting. Thank you, DRA, and especially for your patience. Um, we were on the agenda in December and I had an emergency come up last minute. So thank you for working with us to reschedule. We appreciate it. Um, and as DA Ryan had shared, several, actually many of our Greater Little Partners have seen Marisa and or myself present on the co-op. So we tried to create a kind of happy medium between some new information um, as well as giving some context for those who haven't shared or haven't heard. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yeah, cool. Okay. So as Dee Ryan said, my name is Lainey Emond. And I'm Marisa Firma. I'm the day-to-day -day supervisor for the local op team. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about, like I said, the co-op. Um, so the formal name is the Lowell Community Opioid Outreach Program. You'll hear us call it a couple different things. Locally, it's known as the co-op because there are so many different co-ops out there. I like to formally brand as the Lowell co-op. You'll hear us say team. Um, so whatever we're referencing as, we're talking about the same program. So there we go. So our agenda for today is we'll talk about what is the Lowell co-op, who is the Lowell co-op, because we have quite a few new members. We've had some turnover um, and I'm excited for Marisa to introduce them to you. Um, the impact of COVID-19 on the co-op, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Okay, so what is Lowell Co-op? So, hold on, let me just rearrange my screen a little bit. The Lowell Co-op is the City of Lowell's post-overdose outreach team. Um, they're a team of first responders and clinical specialists from the Lowell Police Department, Lowell Fire Department, Lowell Health Department, Lowell House Addiction Treatment and Recovery, and Trinity EMS. The mission of the Lowell Co-op is to reduce the number of fatal and non-fatal overdoses in the city while increasing the number of overdose survivors who access treatment services. Um, we currently have seven members on the Lowell Co-op, so we have a pretty big team doing outreach. Um, and uh, we have Marisa as our supervisor, so we have eight members on the team in total. 
So the low co-op falls up with um, individuals who have experienced a documented opioid related overdose within 24 to 48 hours. And we use the term documented because um, we know that there are individuals who overdose who don't call 911, who don't go to the hospital. So we receive our overdose reports from our police department and Trinity EMS, and we do follow um, all of the HIPAA guidelines when it comes to receiving releases to share this information and follow up. Um, we completely acknowledge that, again, there are overdoses that happen that we don't know about. And if we don't know about them, then um, we can't follow up on them. So um, the co-op uh, connects clients and uh, so opioid overdose survivors and their families to treatment, recovery, behavioral health, harm reduction, and other supportive services. And they meet clients where they're at, whether they're ready for recovery or not. Um, and they aim to connect clients with the most appropriate service providers. Again, whether that be treatment or mental health, or maybe that's medical or housing or employment. It's really about where the client is at and what they're looking to work towards. Uh, let's see, so up until recently, the co-op only worked with clients who were 18 years or older, um, but we have now expanded services to work with clients who are 18 years and younger, which Marissa will get into in a little bit. Um, so there are several things that are really unique about the Lowell Co-op. So they're an outreach team comprised of assigned staff from five agencies. So it's three city departments and two community-based organizations. Uh, so currently the Lowell Health Department has programmatic oversight of the co-op and our police department has financial oversight of the Lowell Co-op grants, which we'll get to in a bit. So the Lowell Co-op is truly a group effort. Uh, there are five agencies on board. So as you can imagine, we have different perspectives, different expertise, different values, different regulations for our staff, different rules for our staff. Um, and these different perspectives and experiences of each agency and of each staff allow for a really well-rounded client experience um, or client engagement experience. Um, our staff bring so much to the table from skill sets they've learned on the job outside of co-op as well as their own personal experiences. Um, and although the health department has programmatic oversight, this, this is a team effort. Like we make decisions collectively. Um, one would think that with so many different agencies on board, it might be difficult, but really the staff is our best interest. The low cop team members are our best interest because they're the ones doing the hard work. So we, we tend to make decisions really quickly together to support them. So we also work closely with UMass Lowell as they're our research partner on our grants. Um, and UMass brings this added level of perspective and experience that makes us think even more critically or better work. So we really value having them on board. So in addition to our boots on the ground team, the team I'm referring to as a little co-op, we also have um, the Lowell Co-op Supervisory Team. So this supervisory team is comprised of supervisors of Lowell Co-op staff, um, or sorry, yeah, supervisors of Lowell Co-op staff, programming grant managers and our research partners at UMass, as well as any other staff that our agencies feel like would be of value sitting at this table. So we meet monthly to identify ways that we can support the co-op team members. We make decisions, we discuss rules and regulations, we put policies into place for the team, and we identify any needs areas and we find ways to support the team with those needs areas. Um, some months we have a massive list of things because stuff comes up in the community all the time and the co-op is constantly finding new ways to kind of address issues and find the best way to work with, with clients to meet them where they're at. And other times, you know, we're doing more of a check-in and kind of a follow-up to make sure the team is doing well and how they're supporting themselves. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've really just been focusing on, on the well-being of the staff and we've all had various um, rules and, and policy changes and um, throughout the departments that we've had to follow. So we've been spending a lot of time checking in on those, um, but more on that in a bit. So um, ultimately the supervisory team is a source of support for the co-op. They spend all of their time focusing on clients. So we in turn get to spend time focusing on them. And I wanted to bring up um, our co-op supervisory team because I don't often hear about a lot, a lot of other outreach programs talk about a higher level decision-making team for this outreach team. I think it's really important for us because we have so many people at the table that we have a group of people who can make decisions in some ways, it makes it easier for the team because they don't have to be the ones to make decisions and they can have someone to blame if they don't like the decisions being made. But we tend to always make the decisions in the best interest of the team. Okay, so let's see. So as you can imagine, this did not just happen overnight between the supervisory team and the creation of the little co-op. So the idea for the little co-op began in 2016 and it started with a police officer and an outreach worker uh, from Lowell House and it has evolved from there. 
So in 2016, the Lowell Police Department was awarded a three-year federal grant to support the Lowell Co-op as like an initial initiative. And then in 2019, they were awarded a second grant to continue efforts and then expand, which again, we'll get into in a second. Um, however, not all positions on the co-op are grant funded. So not all initiatives, again, and positions are grant funded. And we have several positions that are paid, paid for in full by different agencies, which is great for sustainability. That is ultimately our goal is to have the co-op be a program that does not rely on grant funding. Um, so as of now, um, because of the grant funding and because the agency stepping in to pay for positions in full, we're not concerned about funding, which really gives us, um, gives the team members more flexibility to focus on clients and get more creative. Um, and we don't go through insurance. There's no insurance reimbursement. So that allows for even more flexibility. Um, really the, the, the focus of the team member is meeting the client where they're at and then providing services based on what is the best decision between the client and the co-op member. So the co-op is the community resource. So pre-COVID, um, the co-op presented at cl in classrooms, both at the universities, um, as well as um, schools within the city. They hosted resource tables at community events. They spoke on panels. Um, although the co-op is focused on post orders outreach, they were really immersed in the community pre-COVID. Um, they you know, provided educational content on harm reduction and local resources. They are like our champion of, like, of spreading the word about local resources. Um, and you know, doing Narcan trainings and signs of opioid overdose. And you know, we look forward to getting them back out there when it's safe. So I wanna just wrap up uh, the who is the low co-op section by saying that um, this has been a trial and error process over the past few years. And I, um, I wanna acknowledge that it's important to share, like to talk about trial and error because post overdose outreach is not a one size fits all for every community. There's so many different models out there. Um, and I know we talk about kind of like our stumbling blocks, right? As like a, you know, when we create new programs, um, but when we started the little co-op, there weren't too many models out there to base it off of them. We were also kind of figuring it out. So although the mission of the co-op hasn't changed over the years, our processes have. We've adapted to the needs of the community and we've adapted to the needs, needs of our team members. Um, hold on, sorry. Um, you know, we brought Maurice on as the full day-to-day -day supervisor. We've expanded the team to meet different needs of different populations. And ultimately we've balanced, right? Like these world, the real world work with our grant deliverables. We've had so many back and forths between ultimately this work is for clients. And yes, it's great to have grant funding, but you know, we need to, we need to be real and we need to meet like real expectations. Um, Maurice and the co-op are always discussing ways to enhance services to better track client notes, to streamline communication with, um, community partners and just enhance the overall experience for the local community. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Marisa, who's going to talk about our team members. Um, and I am in control of slides. So Marisa, just give me a little nod or something when you Absolutely. want to. Awesome. Um, there's a perfect example of um, our sort of pre-COVID events. Um, we're presenting um, on the left-hand side of your screen at the first annual SUDS. Uh, conference and the team goes out and does street outreach from Summer Street right where we are all across the city of Lowell and in the right hand side you can see a presentation at a local middle school that we gave um, a couple of years ago and if we can like I'd like to show you the actual team where you can see well I was going to say where you could see their faces but you can't <laughs> because we follow CDC guidelines as a team. So um, the co-op is made up of Gianna Sandelli. She's the assistant uh, director of outreach at Lowell House and has the, I think the seniority on the team at three years. She's currently studying for her master's degree in community psychology at UMass Lowell. And then her best friend is her pit bull mix scooter. And then there's Steven Lyle. He's at the front of the photograph. Um, our firefighter from the Lowell Fire Department, more than 10 years experience as a firefighter, trained as an EMT and a recovery coach, and has a 200 pound bull mastiff, Bronson, who occasionally makes visits to the office. Um, one of our newer members, uh, EMT Evan Lucy, he has a bachelor's in sports medicine 
and is applying to medical school. The team is not uh, a group of slouches here. They are hard workers in all areas of their lives. Evan has a Labrador Husky named Adler. And then also a new member to the team is our police officer. He's been a police officer for more than seven years in the city and he wants a dog. So we welcome any suggestions. You can throw them in the chat and we'll send them on to, to Andrew. And um, also new to the team is another EMT. Thank goodness for Trinity EMS. Um, Tim Spinney has been a uh, EMT in Lowell, born and raised. He's been an EMT for more than 25 years. He's also a recovery coach and has a four month old puppy. Uh, Joseph Aniello is our clinical recovery specialist and has been working in recovery for more than 20 years. And he lives with a poly mix named Luna. And our newest position and newest member of the team, Devin Gilmore is our youth outreach specialist. She's specializing in that young population 25 and under and this is a very new aspect of the Lowell Health, uh, the Lowell Co-op. And she has a degree in um, sociology and experience working with residential reentry programs. So a little bit um, of working with people coming out of the um, correction system. And she grew up with black Labradors. So one of the things we started off talking about is the impact of COVID-19. Um, so we're, we're coming up on close to a year when Charlie Baker um, declared a state of emergency. So if we look at this chart, I hope you can all see it very well. Um, if you wanna look at January, you can see roughly about 50 co-op encounters. This is where co-op either initiated or a client initiated contact with us. This is what a co-op encounter is. And I would say for the year 2018-19, and what you see is reflected also in January. January would be a little bit of a slower month. 50 was kind of what we would call, for lack of a better term, normal. Um, and you can see February, a little bit of a dip. We often experience that. Residential programs will also a report that there's sometimes a slowdown in those late winter months before spring starts. And then um, when the emergency was cleared by Governor Baker, we initially thought that we were going to be working from home for about one or two weeks. Each, the low co-op being made up of these five different agencies, each agency assigned their staff as they saw fit for their agency needs. Only our Lowell firefighter was able to continue doing regular co-op work in, in the field. Um, so as weeks turned into months, we found it especially difficult to engage with clients. We did our best um, working from home contacting clients via phone and text as best as we could, but it can, you can imagine that can be difficult as a good part of our population um, does not actually have consistent access to technology. Um, we just kept hoping that this was going to end and we were gonna be brought back into the office. Um, so we didn't, we weren't prepared for a pandemic but we adapted as best we could. And I wanna note that the staff changes began right as we got back into work towards the end of June. And if you're looking at the chart, you can see how the need in the community went up with COVID. Our engagements more than tripled and in some cases were actually quadruple of pre-COVID numbers. And while this was going on, we actually received more support from our partner agencies once we got back into operations. Uh, prior to COVID, we had one EMT. In November, we had two. And we are still able to, you know, accommodate the needs of our member agencies 
as they need teams to respond to their own agencies and what's going on with COVID with them. But um, during that time, that three month period of April, May and early June, where we were really working from home, you can see how difficult it was to maintain contact with clients uh, with this population. When we got back into the office and we're doing multiple times a week, almost daily contact with the supervisory team on how best to operate safely in maintaining COVID restrictions. Um, each agency had different parameters of what they wanted for their staff. Um, and the team adapted, they made the best of it. Some staff were office bound, others couldn't share a vehicle. Um, and team members stopped shaking hands with clients and hugging clients. That was probably a good part of the rapport, but I wanna note also that the, the clients also understood this. This was for the best. Nobody was like, oh, suddenly you don't care about me. On the contrary, they understood it was for, for safety, for everyone's safety. Um, so the team, with our help from our supervisory team, really continued to do the best we can to take things day by day and uh, adjust to the increasing needs. Um, as I said before, I think the graph really represents the stress on the recovery community in general. People um, anecdotally reporting, you know, years of sobriety and found that COVID made their life difficult. And there was a huge increase in relapse as reflected by those numbers. I think that just about covers it. Maybe we can get to some questions, ideas that this presentation may have brought up for people. Actually, real quick, Marisa, so sorry to just jump in before we do questions. I wanted to add two points, um, just to play like the caveat of um, with the numbers going up. Marisa did a ton of work on revamping our data collection process. So in some ways that could be it, but the team had been really, really good at taking notes and you know making sure information was put into our electronic health record. Um, I also wanna share that, and I think we all know this and we all felt it. I don't know how openly we've discussed. Prior to COVID, many of our programs had walk-in services, right? And once COVID hit, those shut down. And when co-op came back into the community, um, through uh, their offices at uh, an outreach office through the Middlesex Sheriff's Office. That office was more or less still open to the community. It was one of the few spaces that you could still walk in. Um, so people were going in to see the co-op, like they were an active presence in the community. And we did have some other programs that were doing the same, but by no means was it the same number pre-COVID um, as, as was you know in June. So the co-op really was turned to as a source of support. Um, and this was coming from the clients. Um, you know, yes, an appointment's great, but sometimes you just need to kind of walk into the program and have a conversation or an immediate need comes up and you're not too sure where to go to and the co-op does a great job at that. Um, so like Marisa said, we, this is how we're gonna wrap up. Um, if anyone has any questions or thoughts they'd like to share, feel free to unmute and throw them out or throw them in the chat. So Lainey, this is Nora. Just quickly, what you're saying is um, that it's no. not maybe the need went up 150 or 200 percent, but it was the access. Oh, oh Marion, you're you're. Oh, she's talking to me now. That it was the access that was provided by the co-op. I think it was a little bit of both. I think that the need was very prevalent. Um, I mean, we all saw it, right? Like providers who weren't in the community, there was almost a sense of guilt, like when we'd reach out to one another about not being present. Um, the, in the recovery community, it was definitely well needed. Um, you know, resources are always needed, but um, even as our conversations with students yesterday, like Marisa has been sharing that there, we are seeing more of a transient population in the community. We're seeing new faces. So there is still a need for services as well, or need to access services, as well as a need to just access support. You know, a lot of what the co-op has done in the past um, involved rapport building and, you know, just kind of being a source of, of I don't know, familiarity in the community. Um, so that was dearly missed when they were gone. I mean, same with all resources. I can't say we're the only ones that this applies to. 
I hope that answered your question. It, it does. Are there other providers yeah. um, on, on the call that have had have seen similar upticks or in Lowell or elsewhere? I'm sorry, Laura. Nora, I lost you for one second. Did you ask me something? No, no, no. I was just we, I, we, I was following up on a question. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. And we were we were just kind of analyzing the kind of what looks like a precipitous uptick in people being served, and that it's kind of a mixture of both a real change in need and the open accessibility of the co-op as opposed to maybe other programs who didn't have the walk-in service. So I was just wondering whether other folks were had seen similar changes. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of kind of looking back analysis of how programs were impacted by the, and, and how individuals uh, were impacted by, by the pandemic. Any thoughts? All right. All right. Well, thank you, guys. This was a I have a. I have oh, a. If Rita, you don't yeah. mind, I have some comments. Please. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to join here today with you. Um, I know that this co-op co team is rather um, modest, and they're telling you what they're doing, but they're not bragging about them like I want to. And I'm here today to tell you that although in the sheriff's wisdom and kindness, he allowed a room to be set aside for the use of office space for our co-op team. So having been working for the sheriff over all these years that they've been here, I see firsthand the goodness that goes on. And I'm going to brag about them because I'm one of their greatest cheerleaders. I see them saving lives on a day-by-day -day basis. They won't tell you that, but I'm going to tell you. They allow people, they go out into the street, the co-op team, and they bring back people. They try to get them into um, detox centers. They put them off to Paul Heffernan's room where they try to get them a job or they try to work them out a resume. Uh, I've seen success stories here unbelievable success stories. We always hear the bad and the tragedies, but you don't hear the good. And I see it every day and I'm gonna tell you about it. They not only do that, but they set up a room here, another room with a bunch of clothes that are donated each and every week. And um, we have, Leah is crying. She's, she's crying, but that we see it. They bring them in here, the homeless, they give them clothes and toiletries and food and you name it. They do that. They won't tell you, but I'm going to tell you. And I'm very, very proud and honored to have them a part of our team. Thank you for letting me say that. I could go on for a few hours, but I know your time is limited. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. We're a humble group of people, so we need a good cheerleader. Well, and as I often do, I completely agree with Rita. You know, the co-op team not only does great work, but it really, in many ways, in its beginnings, changed the involvement of the fire departments. That was the first place that, you know, you don't think about the fire department being involved in this. And they really jumped right in and whether it was being on bikes or being down in the homeless encampments or whatever, they created a very different model. So that has been a great asset to the city of Lowell. I see we have a question um, about, could, did you see that? Can you see that question? I just, I, yeah. Can you describe the visits? Yes, I saw the, the question about the post overdose outreach. Um, so when the team goes out to do a post overdose outreach, um, either from a EMT report or a police report, they will bring a lot of pamphlets, Narcan, anything to help a family and survivors. Um, and we'll pass that as, along as the individuals involved are willing. You know, um, we absolutely respect people's privacy and they have the right to say no. We, we don't want your services. We don't want your naloxone. And sometimes they do that. Um, most often um, they'll take the naloxone and the products and maybe we'll hear from them again in a few weeks. Um, and then sometimes, of course, nobody's home. That happens. Uh, I think the other question was pertaining to OD maps. 
So the Lowell Co-op is um, Lowell centric. We serve the citizens of Lowell. Um, not that we don't get reports from people who reside in other cities and where it's possible, a police officer on our team will notify um, the other towns involved that there's been an overdose, especially if the program already has an overdose uh, dedicated personnel like Tuxbury and Bilberka and Drigget. Um, but we've also given information to, to Medford in Arlington when that person is known to belong um, to that city. So no, we don't use OD maps. I believe that um, the Lowell Police Department is working with the SIM system. Um, a previous officer on the team was trained on the SIM system, but um, so far our new officer has not yet been trained. That's in progress right now. And just thanks, to thanks for mentioning that. I just, that was a, uh, I was gonna ask you, I'm not sure what OD map is myself, but whether or not you were using the SIM system because we, we heard, uh, was it last month? We got a little update about that from Ed Berman, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with OD map, um, the Lowell Police Department and Trinity EMS use it. We had started at the health department to figure out a way we could get involved pre-COVID and then that took a back burner, but um, the team does a really great job. At, and same with Trinity, they're phenomenal at like kind of mapping out where clusters are. And as a community, I mean, one thing, right, we only talked about the co-op, but Lowell takes, a, for those of you who aren't local, we really do take and value a community approach where we are not the only ones who are engaging with the post overdose community, the homeless community, the you know survivor community, the family community. Um, we are actively sharing information and identifying hotspots. Um, we are very vocal about what areas need more support in the community, and we find a way, kind of collectively, with between all of our resources, to to target a new area or find a way to reach new people. Um, with post overdose outreach, right? It's, it could be an encampment, it could be a shelter. Pre-COVID, we would even go into hospitals. We'd go into treatment facilities if necessary. Um, there is some residential follow-up, but honestly it's post overdose. You know, wherever somebody is that we need to connect with, we will find a way to connect with them. Wonderful. So thank, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you both so much. Thank you. If you have more questions that you think of during the meeting, just stick them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, next, as I promised, we're gonna hear about the Bridge Recovery Center. You will remember that Eileen Dern and the folks at Melrose Wakefield have been talking about this program, which is located in Malden. It provides peer-to-peer -peer recovery support for folks over the age of 18 um, and really offers a safe, stigma-free, non-judgmental environment. And the director, um, somebody we all know well, Carrie Ann Cacavaro, I'm getting it better and better every time I say that. Um, Carrie Ann has been just so generous with us in our work since we began doing this really back in 2013. Um, she is a recovery coach, a drug coach advocate, with both personal and professional experience as a former case manager, a clinical outreach advocate for Banyan Treatment Center. She's been a leader on Arlington overcoming addiction and she works to really bring awareness to the community, bridging that gap between active substance use and the multiple pathways that exist to recovery. So they are fortunate to have her as the director of this program. And I'm happy to have you here in this capacity. Carrie Ann, I can't hear you. You couldn't hear me? I couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I say my no, Carrie Ann, I can't hear Carrie Ann. Did you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Let's say. You can? Oh, because. Okay, yeah. how do we switch it? I couldn't hear you from your computer. Guys, it's showing Carrie Ann's mic is muted on my got the icon that she has on mic muted. All right, let me yeah. see. Okay. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Because um for some reason over here in Malden, 
I have a difficult time. I think my energy is like a little too much that I kind of interfere with the technology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm really grateful to be here and um, thank you um, for the invite. And um, so I want to just jump right in to the Bridge Recovery Center because I know that um, I feel like, it, especially in the Middlesex County, we've been hearing a lot about the Bridge Recovery Center. We've been hearing about, um, or we've been hearing from Paul Hammersley and um, Malden Overcoming Addiction since basically 2015 with him and MOA trying to advocate for the Bridge Recovery Center. So um, it is here. And so, like I said, since 2015, um, Paul has been advocating, well, excuse me, let me move. And um, probably around 2017, 2016, 2017, um, MOA linked together with the Gavin Foundation to try to figure out a way that the Gavin Foundation would be able to support Malden overcoming addiction so that our area, our location would be able to have this peer centered recovery center. Um, in 2019, we were granted, we, we received our grant from um, the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. And so that grant has allowed us to secure a location and have a secured funding for um, the next four years. The Gavin Foundation is our host agency, which basically gives people like myself, um, the staff, that work here at the center, kind of like a, a guide to what a successful peer recovery center looks like based off of Divine Recovery Center in South Boston, which was one of the first recovery centers um, grant funded in the state. Um, and so in 2019, right before COVID hit, um, the president of the Gavin Foundation MOA and basically our community all kind of came together and we secured the spot. Our location's right on Commercial Street in Malden. It's a great location right near both train stops. So we are accessible to um, people that are walking. We are accessible to anybody that um, is using public transportation or is able to drive. Unfortunately, right when I got here was right when COVID hit, but it's okay because we are used to challenges. Um, and so in 2020, I joined the team and, and we all came together to uh, build the, uh, have our board of directors, which consists of, like it says, John McGann, Malden Overcoming Addiction and um, MOA. With that being said, the way the grant was laid out is based off of in-person and based off of human connection. So since we received this grant, we really had to figure out and, and navigate in a way that we can bring connection to our community, not in-person based. Mm -hmm. So um, what better way than virtual or um, utilizing what we know and utilizing um, our strengths. So when I joined, the team, I kind of emulated what Divine Recovery Center, what I watched with Divine Recovery Center, and that has a different, that's what, that has a completely different uh, traffic and, and commute that, we, that, that we're used to seeing. But the one thing that isn't different is that it was the most welcoming place. So that no matter what, when we came over to Malden and we, and we really decided how we wanted this center to look like, we wanted no matter what connection to be the basis of everything that transpires in this center. Um, and so here it says connection is the energy that exists between people when they really feel seen. And that's, and that's what, that's what we hold on to. We want you to be seen. Um, so what is the Bridge Recovery Center? The Bridge Recovery Center is a safe place and safe community. It is peer led and peer driven. Um, let me move this over. BRC members and volunteers help to initiate design, create, implement, and evaluate BRC's activities and policies. So 
what that actually means. It's not based off of what I want. Even down to the picture that is behind me has been chosen by our volunteers and our members. Even down to our, um, our daily schedule. It is not based off of what I know works or what, or what the staff knows works. It's based off of what our community, the people that we are trying to serve, what they would like to see, the services that they would like to receive. Our staff and members build off of each other and build off of the character that already exists within themselves. So we're more of an empowerment center. We're not trying to sit and talk and discuss all of your wrongs. We know your wrongs, we know our own wrongs, but we're trying to do is pull from your strengths and empower you to grow out from under that and become a productive member of our community. Our support is provided by the members, by the members and to the members to gain overall wellness. So the wellness looks like fellowship, uh, life skills, boundaries, appointment settings. Our wellness is not one way. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not one way fits all. What we try to do is adapt our wellness plan for each person that comes into the center and they get to dictate what that looks like. BRC aims to create greater possibilities for the members to gain stability and to create better lives. So with that, there's a, what we have noticed is there's a gap. So we have, we have access to treatment. We have access to recovery coaches. Um, there is education out there so that our community can understand, but there's a gap from when you leave treatment to when you decide to enter your community. There's a humongous gap. And most of us revert back to what we know. So what this center focuses on is how do you, how do you gain a bank account? How do you pay your child support? How do we work on stealing your quarry? How do we help you get a um, volunteer work? How do we reintegrate you into society so that you feel comfortable, so that the people that we are serving feel comfortable that they can succeed and not be driven by fear and go back to what they only know, which is the old behaviors. Can you switch to one again? Sorry. Um, So empowerment at BRC, BRC promotes self-determination, hope and empowerment. BRC memberships and participation is entirely voluntary. It does not cost anything for anybody to come here. We do not require any information. We do have a few um, waivers that we ask our members to sign. And that's based off of, um, we, don't want, we don't want to invade anybody's space, but we also want to make sure that the safety is it, the safety and intent is always known when we have our members come here. Our members create the environment. We try to help maintain that, that environment. But if we want people to come in here, we need to be a welcoming, loving, and supportive environment. So that's what we really try to base every day in this center, um, that all are welcomed. It doesn't matter what pathway, it doesn't matter what, what your wrongs were, it doesn't matter even what you're looking for, you're welcomed. Um, and the members hold the power and, and hold the control of their own recovery here. So we welcome MAT, we, cel we welcome um, Celebrate Recovery, we welcome Smart Recovery. If Buddhist, the Buddhist path is the path that you wanna take, please come down and teach us the Buddhist path. What I think works may not work. What the next person thinks works due to their own um, personal experience means nothing in this center. What we try to do is welcome everybody as a whole and uh, hold space really that it, it, it feels possible to recover from whatever the addiction or whatever um, the life experience was. Excuse me. So here are some of the supports that we have offered. These are not all of them, these are just some. We offer community connections and supports. So because like I said, um, MOA was really the advocators for this center. We have recovery coaches through um, Malden Overcoming Addiction. 
we also work with um, Hallmark Health. They're actually downstairs from us. Um, and even the people that sit on our advisory board helping us build this center consists of ABCD, um, Rise Above Sober Living. We try to pull from every, each, each community member so that we can support our members as a whole into a, a positive center that they can actually build a life off of. Um, we offer family and education support. So um, we actually have a family, MOA has started a family meeting that is going to start March 1st. And that will allow um, just support for family members and a space where they can feel that it's, it's okay to talk about um, the fear of having a child that's actively using, or it's okay to talk about losing a child that they loved. Um, we also have peer support and resources. So each one of the staff, we have seven staff members here, and each one of the staff members that work here is a um, recovery coach. They are certified recovery coach. We ask that they don't use that title in this role, but base their role here off of their learning as a recovery coach. So it's, it's we take everybody as they are, and we try to support them whatever way they come. Um, and so with the, with the peer supports, we have night staff that are just solely based on peer supports. We have family engagement supports, and we also have volunteer supports. Um, we work with the drug courts. We work with Malden Drug Court, as well as um, Cambridge Drug Court. And what we try to do is try to assist in the re-entry into society. So how do we help you build that trust? And we try to make sure that the understanding here in the center is that we're here to support the person served, not the organization that we have our connections with, but the person served so that the person has the best outcome possible. Um, we also assist with housing, education, and employment resources. In our computer room, we have not only the computers so that everybody obviously has internet access, but we had to be also mindful of the people that um, have been incarcerated for a really long time. They don't have an understanding of how to use the internet and they, have, they don't have an understanding of how to use a computer. So we have collected two very large filing cabinets and have filled it with a lot, not, the, not Google amount, but a lot of resources in our area that we feel um, may be able to help somebody fill out their mass health, apply for food stamps, um, find transportation. We also work with relapse prevention and we're actually in the process of creating a re relapse prevention group for the daytime. Um, like I said, we have recovery coaching and we also try to, um, anybody who's looking to become a recovery coach, we also ask that they link up with Malden Overcoming Addiction and learn from their experience and see if they can apply for Malden Overcoming Addictions Scholarship, which, which is a, they help people get trained to be certified as a recovery coach. Um, we have volunteers. Um, and so what we ask our volunteers to do, our, volunte our volunteers consist of not only our members, but various organizations around here, family members, people who have lost. And so what we really try to do is utilize the space here and try to go off of what they think might work. Um, so if we know that, um, if we know that the drug court is looking for support during, during an event, what we try to do is pull from our volunteers as well as our staff and try to join together and see how we can support um, the drug court. We also uh, work with referrals. We, we send referrals to detoxes, to therapy, wh wherever they need to be. We open December 1st, and I'm going to tell you in the month of December, obviously a very challenging time due to the holidays and due to um, the New Year's, but we were able to assist 16 people getting into treatment. And so without like the word of mouth or the understanding of what we really are, having 16 different people call us and reach out to us for support in our area is enormous. Um, and we've also been working with the sober houses in Malden and the surrounding areas to try to 
set up aftercare or any type of referrals and be that like line of connection so that during this time of COVID where we're isolating and there's a lot of mental health and there's a lot of, um, we're disconnected. We, well, instead of assuming that our members can come here, what we are trying to work through is meeting our members where they are at and physically going to the sober houses or wherever they feel comfortable and, and assisting them with whatever needs that they have. Um, we also obviously have support groups. We have social activities. So this summer we are putting together a sober softball team. You know, the South Boston one, they've, they're kind of hard to beat. So we've been pulling all our best male softball players in the area that we know of, because we'd like to get that trophy. Um, we, you know, Medford has a kickball tournament every year, which is a very large recovery event in our area. And so we will be putting together a bridge recovery center kickball team. And we're gonna get the best kickers because we really wanna win that trophy too. Um, I'm pretty competitive over here. Um, and then, you know, like looking forward wise, the next um, overdose awareness day, August 31st, like hopefully we, what we can be able to do is plan an event at the bridge recovery center that we can hold and, and give members to those that we have loved. Um, and then we have our recreational activities. So we like to go hiking. Um, this summer, we're gonna be going to the beach and not just fun, not just like, you know, fun things, but we also are trying to do community cleanups. Um, we'd like to, you know, connect with, you know, the nursing homes or, or any other um, business in, in our surrounding area that may need support that we have not thought of. We were talking yesterday about the impact of losing your first bike that like all of us remember that first bike we ever had and how it got stolen or how whatever the tires broke and we all sat down and thought wouldn't it be great if we could somehow raise money to buy children back their first bike because it's very traumatic losing your first bike like you think it's so insignificant but what if we could change like change the process of everything seems very small and insignificant, but you know, we want to give back as much as possible. Um, here is a picture of on the on this side over here. This is our TV room. Um, and so what we hope to have eventually is like Friday night movies, um, game nights. So what we would try to do is if our members are looking for we would have like a video game night that um a few of the members would come in and play the video games and have like a little tournament or um like a pizza and a movie night because we want this to be a safe place that people decide to come to instead of going back out and back into their old behavior um on the right side we have our pool room so that pool room we have um, customized pool balls too that say the Bridge Recovery Center. It's pretty awesome. Um, but it also converts to a ping pong table. And what we try, we're trying to do team building things and like learning how to like team build and be competitive, but be competitive in a healthy manner. Um, we don't allow any betting, obviously. So um, we ask that anybody that is playing in the game room doesn't make any bets. Um, and then at the bottom, that is our main meeting room. So it's a pretty large room. And as of right now, we are able to hold 30 people sitting in that room, sitting six feet apart. Um, and so any of our larger night meetings, that's where the meeting will be held. But we also have a very large kitchen. And so part of our like life skills is teaching like healthy eating, um, learning how to food shop, um, learn, learning how to portion control, um, cooking classes. And then during holidays, our plan is to have large turkey dinners, let's say for Thanksgiving, um, Christmas, and also feed people that are not able to um, receive those resources on, those, on their own. Here are some of the groups that we have offered. So, the majority of the groups here listed have been offered virtually. We just announced this morning 
that um, our center is opened fully for in-person at 40% capacity. So everything that you see right here will not only will not only be held virtually, but we will also allow it to be held in person as well. So we have, like you see, all recovery meetings, which is um, any pathway. We have writing workshops, um, meditation. We have a Thursday night um, Spanish speaking men's meeting. Um, the Gamblers Anonymous meeting, they meet the first, no, the third Wednesday of every month. Um, and we have our medically assisted treatment meeting. And this is just a small, we've only been open since December 1st. So this is what our members have decided up until this point, which this is incredible. This isn't us creating it, it's our members creating it. Um, and hopefully from, from here, we're just gonna continue to grow. The best one I have to tell you is our Facebook Live. We do a Monday and Friday um, live music lunch break. And so sometimes like healing isn't about talking. It's just about like, you know, letting it go and just having some fun. So one of our staff, our assistant director, um, he is a DJ on the side. So what he does, he brings his DJ equipment in and he offers twice a week a free like DJ music mix. So it's actually, to be honest with you, we get the most hits from it. So it's, it, it works. Um, and, and that's really all we have right now. And if you have any questions, just let me know. People, have, <clears throat> excuse me, people have questions for Carrie. That was great. Well, I, I have a question that just has to do with the softball team and the kickball team. Have you hooked up with the folks from, um, um, oh gosh, Phoenix? So there's this whole amazing recovery community. It's all about wellness and exercise and sports. And there's amazing athletes there. We're going to have to recruit them. We'll recruit them <laughs> down. Listen, the social media are the ones who keep getting a the little competitive to too. So back to the, this county, that's, that's our main goal. Other, any questions of a more serious nature, perhaps? <laughs> You know, we had talked earlier about great success stories and Carrie Ann is one of those great success stories. She's been coming since we did our very first mobile policy forum up at Lowell General Hospital. And I have to say personally, it just has been an amazing thing to see how she has grown in this work. She is an amazing success. And Reed is right. See, I've said Reed is right three times today. Um, you know, something that we don't always think about. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. You know, I was thinking this, I was thinking this morning driving over like the, how this, this has evolved and remembering in 2015 going to um, Lowell General Hospital and we didn't have a lot of information. We really didn't have a lot of the knowledge of what is really going on. And then to think like how many people have joined this right now and have learned just from this platform, it's just, it's, it's incredible because it has totally changed and transformed um, the, the path and destruction that um, unfortunately opioids have really kind of ha have created in, in, in our county. So, and I'm really grateful for you, um, DA Ryan. You've been very influential in my recovery process, um, attending my drug court graduation, um, you know, she sent a nice gift at my wedding. You know, she's been extremely influential in my life and in my process. So I'm very grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, and for people who weren't with us back then, we, when we started doing this work, what we really came to realize was that the voice that was missing at the table was the voice of people with lived experience. And you know, it, you can't really, it's like me telling you what's a great way to, you know, lose weight or what's a great way to change your lifestyle or whatever. Well, if I don't know anything about your lifestyle or how you got to that place or whatever, that's probably just me preaching at you. 
And so that mobile policy forum that we did at the hospital six, seven years, almost seven years ago, I guess, um, we brought people with lived experience and really just listened to them. Project Care was born out of that for unaddressed childhood trauma. So much of what we did was how did you get to this place? And what has not worked? Let's stop doing what hasn't been successful. Successful and how can replicate that across the county. So that has been an incredible piece of our work. So thank you. Thank you. Um, before we open up for updates and conversation, I wanna share a few things. One is I mentioned a couple of those bills before. I have one other bill I wanna talk about. Um, this is House Bill 803. This is a real safety bill. You know, if you are, um, arrested right now for driving your car under the influence of alcohol. Even if you go to the police station and you get bailed out, there is a period of time, a 12 hour period of time when you cannot take your car back because obviously there's still the effects of alcohol. We don't want you driving again. There is no corresponding statute with respect to drugs. So for instance, we had, and you may have seen it, it was on um, the news at some point, an individual was experiencing an overdose as he was driving. He coasted to a stop at the red light. There happened to be an off-duty police officer sitting in the other piece of the intersection. When the light changed and the car didn't move, he realized that the person was overdosing. He got out, happy end to the story. He pulled him out. He had Narcan, he narcan him. He was revived. The car was towed. But when he showed up right afterwards at the tow yard to get his car, the tow owner had no right to prevent him from taking that car. So, you know, an hour after being revived, he could pick up his car and start driving again. So we have filed this bill, which is House Bill 803, to address that and make the impoundment order the same. So if you experience an overdose in your car while you're driving, whatever, there'll be a 12 hour period when you can't get that car again. Because the, and it really, as I said, was brought to us by the tow truck drivers because their problem was when you showed up with the money to get your car, they had no ability to say, you are still high, you are still under the influence, you can't drive the car. They had to give it, They have right now they have to give it back to you. Um, and they are obviously frightened about doing that. So this bill would create that for any substance in addition to alcohol, because right now it only applies to alcohol, right? So that is a real public safety. You know, when you th think of all we do about trying to get people on the road to recovery, having a terrible accident with terrible injuries or something is not what we want on that road. So, all right. Um, I wanna share some information about the Biennial con Conference that's sponsored by the Center for Black Health and Equity. Registration for the conference actually closes tonight. It is next week, um, March 2nd and 3rd. This is really important for everybody because this center promotes campaigns, resources, programs for the African-American community. It's culturally appropriate information, training, strategies, trying to address many of the health inequities that exist caused by racism in the black community. Um, on March 2nd and 3rd, they're gonna be tackling COVID. We've all seen all of the stories about how the black community has been hit harder, how there is a greater reluctance around the vaccine, all of that. Um, they're also gonna be tackling gun violence, mental health and more. And it really is a way for anybody to start developing a policy plan around black health for their organization. Um, so that is a great thing. And even if you don't, participate in their con their conference, I recommend you going on their website. Um, Nora's putting that information in the chat and there's a lot of really good information and resources. Um, this is another important piece. On March the 8th, NAMI Central Middlesex is sponsoring in conjunction with the Mystic Valley Behavioral Health Coalition and others, a seminar on behavioral health and college campuses. Um, continuing issue for us. They will have a panel of college administrators, recent college graduates who had mental health challenges in college. 
And some of the focus pieces of this will be working with families whose kids are about to go to college to start having those conversations at home about mental health. Um, the importance, especially for parents of understanding privacy laws, what can and not be communicated. I've heard many, many times I'm paying the tuition bill. Why can't I know what's going on with my son? or daughter and the college is just to, in most circumstances cannot share that information so what do you do about that um, and the kinds of support so this is open to families whether it's the parents and guardians or the kids and we'll put that in the chat as well and now i'll open it up to anybody who's got updates or discussion points anything from people just feel free to unmute, jump right in. Marion, can I ask a question on the 803? Yep. Um, I honestly thought that the alcohol and drug was already connected, right. but uh, the tow people, isn't there also not just that they fear for a person's self, self, you know, health and safety, but aren't they maybe liable just like somebody that's giving uh, a bartender, if you, uh, you know, keep on giving somebody alcohol when you feel that they had too much, if they let that person take the car within a, less than a 12 hour, in an hour period, wouldn't they be liable? Not really, probably not because, you know, it's not like what you're talking about is the DRAM statute, which is, yes. you know, if I'm a bartender and you come in drunk yes. and I continue to serve you knowing you're going to stagger out to the parking lot and get your car, I can be held liable for this. They're not involved in providing the substance or anything. It's, uh -huh. it's like, really, if you, uh -huh. if you are intoxicated and you walk out to the garage and you give the garage guy your ticket, he's going to bring you the car. Um, they really have no protection. And if they call the police and the police come over, there may not be anything they can arrest you for. You're paying the money. You've got your ticket to get your car. That's what they're so concerned about is that, you know, obviously we don't want anybody to get hurt, whether it's the person or the counter. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we know perfectly we can overdose in your car ambulance decide against medical advice to leave come back out you're looking for your car and right now there's just nothing that prohibits them from giving you back the car that's what they came to us with this and we've had a number of tow trucks we filed this um last year i guess and we had a number of tow truck drivers and owners come to the state house and testify about you know they have kids they have families that are out on the road they are uncomfortable letting these drivers back out there. And also they're not an expert. You know, they're not an expert of, if you say, well, it's been five hours and I'm feeling pretty good right now, you can't leave them in that position. This would be just flat out, you got over, you got Narcan six hours ago, come back in six more hours and we'll let you take your car. Marion, it's, is it, it's not just um, um, opioids. It would Anything be besides alcohol. So mushrooms, anything, whatever. If you, in connection with that car, if you bit, had some kind of an overdose or a revival, you can't get back in the car for 12 hours. Hello. Hi. Yeah. I'm sorry, go, uh, this is Lou Samagli, Director of Veteran Services in Wilmington. Uh, yep. I was wondering if you've heard, or, or I know the, um, the veterans the veteran suicide rate has gone up 20% since COVID and active duty 30%. Um, my question is the, the C box, the community-based outpatient clinics right now are not doing any in-person mental health visits. And I was wondering if you, um, I know it's a federal issue, but I was wondering if you had heard about that or, or if things that you could help us out with. I have, um, and I, I know that that lack of services, especially, you know, around out in Bedford and whatever, that's a real problem. I don't know. I have not heard anything about the plan to roll out any alternatives. I mean, I know, for instance, Bedford police and whatever have been trying to connect people with other telehealth portals or somebody who will do an in-person intake or something. But you're right. There's a real deficit there that's not being taken care of. 
specifically the Lowell Sea Buff. Um, hi. I don't know. You know, what about, okay. let me, can I ask you guys from the co-op, like, are those, if those folks reached out to you, would you be willing, able to help them if they can't get their veteran services? Um, we work with um, vets and connect them to different services in the area all the time. Um, I do think Lou's correct in that there are not many programs that are doing in person off the top of my head, I know that home base, home base um, is, home base is, is, is doing, is some, doing yeah. some things, but of course you have to get down to um, Boston. And I do think they do offer some transportation if they're not directly in the Boston area. But well, the um, other thing for transportation- always willing to help. I'm oh, sorry. The other thing we have for transportation is we can connect people to our friends. Um, where's Nora? Um, Oh, oh, yes. Drums. Rides for recovery folks. Right. Yeah. They'd be very interested in helping. Joe and them. Joni. Yeah. Yeah. So we, they do drives. All you, it's really, you can just sign up and you get rides. So because home base is the only place I've heard that's got some in-person program going. Home base is the best. Uh, it is a many, great, they, great They're an program. amazing organization. As a matter of fact, I'm having them up here to uh, train our first responders on, you know, the red flags and all that. But uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been a, a pretty tough stretch with the Lowell Seabock not allowing inpatient uh, in person. So. Nora, can you get Lou that ride name? Because if you had the transportation piece, then if people wanted to call home base, especially if you got them coming. I yeah, and they're happy to do the rides. I, I so asked that and then Elizabeth wanted to make a, a an announcement about the, the wheels of hope as well. And then it will jump okay. in, we'll jump to you, Kristen, as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, it was uh, my name is Elizabeth Reardon. I work with the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline, which is funded by through BSAS. Um, and we have recently relaunched our Wheels of Hope program, which is a, tr a free transportation service for folks who are in the Merrimack Valley um, to any sort of uh, you know, detox or residential program anywhere in Massachusetts. So as long as you're uh, calling and, and starting in Merrimack Valley, we can get you anywhere in the state free. Um, and we also will give up to seven round trip rides to MAT within the Merrimack Valley. So you know, if you're initiating it and you don't know how to get there, we can bring you for up to a week um, while you figure out kind of your rides or if you you know, if your car breaks down or you can't get there, uh, we can also bring you. So I just kind of wanted to make sure that folks know about this great service. I'll put our link in the sub in the Massachusetts Substance Use Helpline. Uh, uh, we have more information on our website, so I'll put that in the chat. Um, but thanks for the work that everybody's doing here. Thanks. And Kristen? Hi, can you, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, I had a question about the data that was being shared right at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and I just want to say really quickly that because I work with, um, I work with the public distribution of Narcan. So I oversee the six states in New England. And the, the energy that you guys have in Massachusetts, I, you know, I visit all the task force. I work with a lot of different people. Man, you guys are, <laughs> you guys are amazing. Other states should certainly take take note of what Massachusetts is doing. So good job on all the work. And Carrie Ann, I don't know what coffee you drink, but I definitely want the same. I want the same. <laughs> um, and then my question was for the beginning, when you were citing numbers about the overdose, um, were those deaths or overdose incidences? Just, just They incidences. are deaths. We respond, troopers from our office respond yeah. to any unattended death across the county. All right. So, so those what, are we know those numbers are solid because our troopers physically went out and were part okay. of that situation. So, that does not account for a death where, for instance, somebody's transported from Somerville to Mass General and they die at the Mass General. We okay. wouldn't have that. And okay. it does not at all. The only time we might have um, an attempt, uh, an overdose that does not result in a death is if someone were very close to death, we were called, and then yeah. somehow, which does happen, somehow they miraculously are revived and survived. 
Okay. Okay. So what was that number since January 1st? Was there a total number? I had the cities broken down, but since January 1st, we have had 42. And that's just for your county, no right? Sense. I'm sorry. That's just for this. That's for this county, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to push out to put out is um, for people, I know this will get everybody's attention. Everybody's always looking for money. Um, one of the really good things since the Biden administration took office is the Department of Justice has got a lot of grants, um, fairly substantial grants. I encourage anybody who's looking for what they have out there. Um, sort of a word to the wise is that those likely to be successful are often those where there's a regional application and where you can partner with the prosecutor's office. So we are happy to partner with people if you want to go for one of those grants. Um, you know, we are a county where it makes sense for especially some of our smaller cities and towns to partner together. And we have this county, you know, really urban and rural community. So if you look at those and there's something you're interested in, feel free to call us. Um, we now have somebody in our office who's going to be spending some of her time working on those grants. Um, you know, there's just a lot of money out there. A lot of them are half million dollar grants. So it's definitely worth it. It's hard to, they are very wordy and whatever, as you know, and it's hard to just plug through them, but it's definitely worth looking at it. See if there's something you want and then see if you can put a group together. And we will, you know, sometimes we have to be a co-sponsor. Sometimes we are just a supporter. We're happy to be helpful with all of that. All right, and finally, our next meeting, which will be March 31st from 10 to 11.30. Um, this will be, as many of you have heard it before, um, a great meeting. We'll have John Kelly with us from Trinity. He has in the past talked about the data-driven information that Trinity EMS produces. Our participants from Lowell know that, and I'm confident that folks from out the, throughout the county will find this valuable in terms of he's able to look at when the days of the week, what are the hours, what do we see times of the month um, in terms of when overdose happens. As we will, as always, send out a reminder and a final agenda, but thank you again for being here. It's good to see everybody at least virtually and stay well and safe. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. Thanks all. Take care.